So welcome to Bartlett Wealth Management's 2020 Outlook, steady and ready. We hope this year, right? Um, 2019 really was a banner year in terms of growth of our clients' assets and for Bartlett overall. We have an incredible team of talented individuals who work on behalf of our clients every day. And for those who are in the room today, I'd like for all of them to stand so they can be recognized. This year, Bartlett Wealth Management had several records. We experienced a record number of new client relationships. We achieved 99% client retention. Our assets under management grew to over six and a half billion. And we hired a record number of new employees this year to support all of our growth. We gained a lot of regional and even national recognition in Barron's this year for the first time. So it was a really great year for Bartlett and I thank um, all of those who helped us with that uh, very much. This past year, and I would say actually the last couple of years, we have invested in our most important asset and that is our people. We invest in people who have expertise in, comp in providing comprehensive financial planning services and wealth management services that our clients deserve, that all of you deserve, and really have come to know and expect from Bartlett. I am so very proud of the team that we have at Bartlett. I think in my history, um, or in my career in history at Bartlett of over 22 years, this is hands down the best team that we have ever had. And I'm confident about this team because I know that they are delivering peace of mind for all of our clients. And in this, uh, turbulent times, we could say. That's what we're all looking for. Many years ago, the Bartlett founders set a standard of excellence, care, and commitment to our clients. And that still guides us in our culture today at Bartlett. I'm pleased to say that our company uh, is healthy and that we have a dedicated team of people who are here to grow with all of you in 2020 and for many years ahead. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Nobody had to get over the snow or the rain, so thank you all for coming. Uh, we thank you for allowing us to be with you on your journey and to be involved in your lives. We know that you put your trust and your loyalty with Bartlett, and we appreciate that greatly. For us, it's important that you know that, uh, that we really feel privileged and that it's a pleasure working with all of you. Uh, our business is pretty intangible, and so getting to see uh, how what we do for you impacts your lives is really important. As I mentioned, growth and expansion has been a big part of our, our theme this past year. And 2009 certainly um, has and will continue uh, to allow us to better serve you as we have continued growth and expansion. This past summer, an acquisition with a reputable Chicago firm allowed us to uh, really solidify our presence in the Chicago area. So before uh, Jim Haggerty and the team comes up to make the presentation today, we have a short video um, which introduces Bob Dearborn, the senior portfolio manager of our Chicago office. And he will say a few words and invite you up to Chicago if you're ever in the area. Hello from the Bartlett Chicago office. My name is Bob Dearborn and I'm a director and senior portfolio manager at Bartlett. And on behalf of our Chicago team, we thank you for the opportunity to introduce ourselves at this year's annual Market Outlook presentation. As we enter the new year, I do reflect on our former firm, Lodestar Investment Council's decision to join forces with Bartlett in 2019. It became very clear to us that there were aspects of Bartlett's business that were just perfectly aligned with our firm here in Chicago. A few of those were an investment approach and strategy that was completely aligned with one another. Two, a business orientation that's 100% client-centric. 
Number three, we have wonderful employees, exceptional people who are highly valued up and down the organization, which is the same within Bartlett's organization in Cincinnati. And finally, we were able to bring, we knew we could bring additional resources that would be very important to our clients, including a very sophisticated and high level financial planning capacity, as well as incredibly deep investment resources that Bartlett provides. We would welcome you at any time to visit Bartlett Chicago office. We're downtown in the city of Chicago, located Kitty Corner to the Willis Tower, formerly the Sears Tower. We're very excited about the future of this combined firm. We feel that we can provide a number of additional and higher level services to our clients, which is very important. And we feel that the combined firm is poised for great success going forward. So I thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks to everyone for coming today. Um, I have a reputation for going off the script every year, and I'm going to do that right away, um, erase the suspense. Kelly mentioned how seriously we take client retention. And in fact, our goal every year is 98%. And we have incentive pools at the firm that you can't participate in as an advisor if you're not at 98%. And last year, one of our advisors set a record 100% client retention. Never been done before, and that's Lori Poole. <laughs> well, I want to begin by asking for your help uh, to make our session a very productive one. At each of your place settings, you'll find a question card and a pen. Incidentally, you can keep the pens. Um, but what we'd like you to do during the course of our presentation, uh, jot down questions as they occur to you. These will be collected later on, and we'll use them in the question and answer session uh, with the panel. And uh, Kyle Pullman, to the far left, is on the panel. And, and uh, Kyle likes hard questions. The harder, the better. So thanks in advance for your help. Many of you were here a year ago at Cooper Creek, January of 2019, and so we wanted to begin with a candid look back at what we told you then. Um, what did Bartlett get right, and what did we miss? When we met a year ago, we had just finished up a very disappointing 2018 in the markets. The stock market had a negative year. We had a chaotic sell-off in the month of December. For the trivia buffs, December 2018 was the worst December since 1931, all the way, up, all the way back to Herbert Hoover. And um, it was a very, very uh, uncertain time. It was a period of time, a lot of apprehension about 2019, and it was not uncommon to find uh, recession predictions. And in light of all that, Bartlett had a fairly optimistic outlook. We thought the economic expansion was intact. The indicators we were tracking looked favorable. We did think a little slower growth was likely, but we thought a recession was not probable. And because of that, we were maintaining equity allocations and emphasizing higher quality companies, really biased in favor of quality since it was, we were going into the eighth or ninth year of the expansion. All those things worked out very, very well. Um, we did, however, have a much more tempered outlook for the bond market. We thought very low rates of return were likely from bonds. And uh, the bond market, as you'll see later on, wound up being very good in 2019. So not a perfect report card, but a pretty good one. And speaking of report cards, we'll take a look at the economy. We finished 2019 with the economy still in expansion mode, up 2.1%. Inflation remained low. When we met you here a year ago, unemployment was at 3.9%. You have to go all the way back to Lyndon Johnson, late 1960s, when we had 3.9% unemployment. Well, here we are a year later, it's even lower, 3.5% unemployment. So if you have children or grandchildren that are finishing up college, they're coming into a very, very promising labor market. 
And a pretty good year for business, uh, corporate profits and dividends both higher, although as you'll hear later on, corporate profits are kind of slow. But all in all, a pretty good report card. And that resilient economic performance more than anything else is why we had such great markets. Uh, a really, really terrific market report card. Um, at the top of the heap, the US stock market. Uh, here we're using an index, the Standard & Poor's 500 index. That's an index of primarily large blue chip companies like Apple and Microsoft and Procter & Gamble. 31.5% total return, best year since 2013. Also a good year in foreign markets. The main index was up 22%. And the bond market, as I mentioned, that surprised us. A really, really fine year in bonds, 8.7%. To put that in perspective, when Lori does financial planning for clients and we're, we're making assumptions about the long run rate of return on stocks, I think she uses 7%. So you see bonds returning 8.7% in 2019. That's a marvelous performance for bonds. And uh, cash, you might remember when we reviewed 2018 results, cash had been the best asset in 2018. It returned to its normal place in 2019. Although 2.3% is a pretty good rate of return on cash, as you'll hear from Kyle Pullman later on, we're very fortunate here in the United States to get positive returns on our cash. Uh, I would say the key takeaway from this is that most clients have balanced accounts that feature a blend of all these asset classes. And last year, a typical balanced account would have produced a total return, income plus growth, of 20 to 25%. So really a marvelous year. Enough about 2019 and on to 2020 and beyond. And um, as Kelly mentioned, our theme is steady and ready. Uh, most days I feel steady, not always ready, but steady and ready is our theme for 2020. And this marvelous panel to my left is certainly uh, ready to explain what all that means. Uh, as you know, markets have made continued progress in 2020. We're near record high levels in the stock market. And so it's fitting that Kyle Pullman will kick off with a discussion of risks that have been building uh, in the markets. Uh, Brian Antonucci will follow Kyle and talk about uh, longer-term opportunities, things that we view as very, very favorable for economic growth and market performance long-term. Uh, I think you'll come away from Brian's remarks feeling encouraged that uh, America's, en Amer America's economic engine is in, in pretty good shape and that companies remain very resourceful and innovative. That's going to benefit us as investors but also as consumers. And then uh, Lori Poole is going to conclude and put all of that together and talk about what that means for our portfolio management. Uh, how are we keeping accounts invested but with appropriate safeguards? And importantly, how are we keeping financial plans very current? So I think it's a very, very fine panel. Um, and after their presentation, we will have uh, what I look forward to the most, the question and answer session where you get a chance to test them. So without further ado, let's hear from Kyle Pullman. Yeah, as Jim mentioned, my job today is to uh, discuss the growing risk in both the economy and in the financial markets. But I also have somewhat of a, a secondary job as well, which is to you know, be kind of a wet blanket and really temper some of those wonderful feelings that we have from 2019, those robust return, uh, returns that Jim mentioned. So um, if we talk about these risks, we get a really good idea what our current environment looks like, and we can stay steady for the discipline that we need and ready for any surprises that we may have, just as you would expect us uh, to do. So let's kick it off with uh, the growing risk to the economy. Here we have charted the leading economic index, and that's just uh, an index that's got 10 different economic components uh, that combine to, to make the index, and people use this to predict the future direction of the economy. So for example, if that line is going up, we'd expect the economy to expand, and if that line is going down, we'd expect the economy to contract. Now it's important that you know that when that line peaks and then starts to go down, 
uh, we usually see an economic recession about six to 18 months after that happens. And those economic recessions are indicated on the chart here with the vertical gray bars. So if you look in that circle, we zoom in on the most recent data of the LEI, and you'll notice that over the last year or so, it's flattened out. So at a minimum for us, that's a big yellow light. But at its worst, if the LEI have truly peaked, we'd expect to see a recession, and recessions bring some of the most challenging environments that we see in our industry. Very, uh, think of bear markets. So it's been a long, long time since we've talked about bear markets in a room like this, maybe 10 years, but we know it's a part of the full market cycle, and it's our job to be able to invest throughout all different types of markets. So let's move on to a risk that's specific to 2020 that we just cannot ignore, and that's the elections that we'll see in November. So there have been a lot of bold predictions, uh, a lot of noise around uh, what's going to happen in these upcoming elections, and we believe it's that, noise. Here we have charted the uh, last 40 or so years of the S&P 500 returns, and that spans seven different presidential administrations. So what we hope that you take away from this chart is that both Democrats and Republicans have both good and bad market returns. And we know that it's impossible to predict returns based on the election outcomes, and therefore, it doesn't have a big role in our strategy. Uh, yes. That doesn't mean that we're not paying attention to anything political. For example, if the political action has any uh, impact on the economy, we pay a lot of attention. And I think the most current example is the trade tariffs that you probably hear a lot about in the news. So it's our perspective and our belief that the reason that the manufacturing sector in the United States is in recession is due to these trade tariffs. So we don't know exactly how this trade war will play out over the long run, but what we do know is that the uncertainty that it creates creates risk for economic growth going forward. Another big risk we see to the economy are negative interest rates. And you'll see on this chart that a number of different countries around the world do indeed have negative interest rates. I think the favorite one for us to point out is the flag second from the right, that's Germany. Uh, Germany is the largest economy in Europe and also has some of the most significantly negative interest rates that we see. But most of the time when I'm talking to someone about negative interest rates, they don't really understand what I'm talking about. And you know what, you really shouldn't because there's no economics textbook out there that would have prepared you for this reality. Why would we want to lock in a negative return for all your hard-earned money? So you might be asking yourself, how did we get here? Why do we have all these negative interest rates? And it's really a pretty simple uh, thought process. Most central banks around the world think that low interest rates provide a greater stimulus for economic growth. And if low interest rates are really good, the negative interest rates must be better, right? And so this is the tactic that they took. Uh, many central banks around the world are purposely making their interest rates negative to try to spur on this extra economic growth. And it's not a small problem either. Here you'll see that as recently as the middle of la as recent as the middle of last year, we had over 17 trillion dollars of bonds with negative yields. So from an economic standpoint, negative interest rates put a lot of stress on our banking system, and that's what we believe is the real economic engine. And from an investment standpoint, all of these negative yielding bonds make it really challenging for us to diversify your bond portfolios on a global level. Now, we don't know exactly how the slowing LEI or some of these negative interest rates or even the election outcomes might impact uh, or might manifest themselves over time. But what we do know is the risk to the economy grew in 2019, and that leaves a lower margin of safety for investors like you and me. But we didn't just see risk grow in the economy last year, we also saw it grow in the financial markets. So Jim mentioned some really robust returns in both the stock and bond markets. But it's important that you know that the reason that we had such, such strong returns 
is because valuations moved much higher, not necessarily because fundamentals got better. Here we chart the starting valuations for stocks along with their forward 10-year returns. And what we hope you take away from this is that as stocks become more expensive, as you move from left to right on this chart, the returns on a forward 10-year basis go down in a near linear fashion. Today, we're in an above average valuation range for stocks, and that implies that the forward 10-year returns could be below historical averages. But we had really robust returns in the bond market as well, and you may be thinking, fundamentals drove that. Maybe we had lower debt burdens or better balance sheets. But this chart shows the growth in the U.S. corporate debt, and it shows that the borrowing binge in the corporate sector continued into 2019. This allowed for CFOs of large companies to continue to buy back lots of stock, really, really help the, uh, the returns on the stock market, but also help grow their companies through acquisitions. Instead, it wasn't fundamentals that drove the great returns in the bond market. It was prices going up, valuations moving higher. Here we show that when interest rates go down, bond prices go up, and that means bonds are more expensive too. A good example in the United States is our 10-year Treasury yield went down nearly 30% last year, from 2.7 to 1.9, and that really helped drive the return in the bond market. But we talked about the U.S. 10-year Treasury right there. How big of a deal was this on a global level? We think the best way to illustrate that is through the map that we have here. Um, any country that is green in color reduced their interest rates in 2019. And I hope you'll notice that most of the developed economies around the world indeed reduced their interest rates. Uh, that would be countries like the United States, um, the whole, almost all of Europe, Australia, all reduced their interest rates in 2019 in response to the really tough end to 2018. So I mentioned that the, the really great returns from the stock and the bond world were driven by higher valuations, and higher valuations mean we're taking a lot more risk. But why were investors like you and me so much more willing to take on more risk in 2019? So I'm gonna need all of your help today uh, by a show of hands to illustrate this example. How many of you keep as little as possible in your savings or checking account because you don't like that 0% return the bank's offering you? Almost everybody, and me too. It's an extremely common conversation that we have with clients, and this is exactly what is supposed to be happening. Every single one of us who moved out of checking or savings accounts into something a little more risky, maybe a CD or a bond, or maybe something a lot more risky, like stocks, all of us were trying to do it to achieve a higher than this 0% return. And that's what the Fed and other central banks want you to do. Take more risk, invest your money into economic capital to try to produce more activity and more growth. So we generally believe that better fundamentals, like better balance sheets, better GDP growth, stronger earnings growth, we think all of those are more secure drivers of returns. Since we did not get those in 2019, we think some of those wonderful returns that Jim mentioned may be at risk in 2020. So I mentioned earlier that I had a, a secondary job of being that wet blanket and making you all lose that warm and fuzzy feeling. And by looking out there, I know that I absolutely killed that job. <laughs> um, but by, by knowing these risks, we can better strategize for the future and we can really put ourselves in a better position to get through the tough times. Maybe we ought to pause for a moment of silence, or <laughs> somebody want to offer a prayer. Or, um, Kyle, you talked about this extraordinary interest rate environment, very low interest rates, including negative interest rates all throughout Western Europe. And, uh, central bankers with these unorthodox policies. And one of the things that's made that possible is we've had low inflation for some time now, and uh, inflation expectations seem to be low. 
And so the question is, do you see anything on the inflation front looming out there? Any signs that inflation is in fact percolating and could surprise us? Uh, yeah, um, you know, as, as Jim mentioned, you know, when you have low interest rates, there's an expectation that that can overheat the economy and create too much inflation. Um, I think we've been expecting more inflation for 10 years in our industry, and we haven't really seen much of it. Uh, but I can say that we are seeing a little bit. Um, the two places that are, are most, uh, I would say, the most visible are probably in the labor market. Wages are growing over 3%, maybe near 4% for the last few years. That's above the, the normal inflation rate that we're seeing. Um, and also, I think the low interest rates have really had an impact on housing prices. Um, we do have a, a lower inventory of house, houses, and so that's helped pricing go up, but um, definitely had an impact having lower, lower interest rates on housing prices and inflation around housing. So overall, it could be headed a little higher. Right? Yeah, yeah, we would expect at some point okay. it starts to go through. Next up is Brian Antonucci to talk about uh, longer term opportunities in the economy and the markets. Great, thanks Jim. I definitely get the more fun part of the presentation, so thanks for setting the low bar, Kyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there are a number of long term opportunities that we're gonna talk about today, but wanted to first start with a few on the technology side uh, that we believe are gonna be meaningful to our way of life for the next five to 10 years. Uh, as well as the, the companies that we invest in. Uh, so we have 5G, the Internet of Things, or IoT for short, and artificial intelligence. So we'll start with 5G. So what does that mean? It's the fifth generation cellular wireless. 1G gave us sound, 2G gave us texting, 3G gave us mobile web. 4G gave us all of that 10 times faster. And that's basically what we've been on for the last 10 years. 5G is just now starting to roll out, and it's only in select cities right now, but it's gonna be 20 times faster than what 4G is currently. So you might say, I don't really need to have faster internet right now, how's that gonna help us? Well, there's a number of ways, and just to show on this chart how the change from 3G to, 4, 3G to 5G has moved the needle, I think personally, when my four-year-old twins and we're boarding the plane and right before the plane takes off and they say, Dad, can you download Lion King on your phone for me? Well, at 3G, that would have been impossible. It would have taken 26 hours. 4G, six minutes, I may be able to get that before the plane takes off. 5G, I'll certainly avoid the, the toddler meltdown in three and a half seconds. So. But from an economic standpoint, uh, there's a... Uh, you know, smartphone economy out there that's estimated to be over a trillion dollars this year. Half of that is going to be from the sale of smartphones themselves, the rest from mobile advertising, apps, and accessories. So to put a trillion dollar economy into context, it'd be the 17th largest in the world, just behind the entire GDP of Mexico and ahead of the Netherlands. So we feel it, it is a major impact um, for the growth of our economy. The next opportunity is the Internet of Things. Currently, the Internet, as we know it, is the Internet of people. People going to websites, e-commerce, and of course, social media. So we think there will be a lot of impacts uh, that, that happen with the Internet of Things because this is an Internet of devices. So it's just devices that can sense and communicate with other devices without the involvement of humans. So very different. In the retail, some of the examples are going to be a company like Walmart who has sensors on their shelves. And as products get low, the sensors are sending communications to the back, we need to restock the shelves. Or we're out of product in the back, we need to send a message to our warehouse to send more to us on Red Bank Road. In transportation, eventually, we'll see autonomously driving cars, trucks, trains, Trains is probably the first of those three. We don't know when, but we know the connectivity, given the 5G rollout and the technology, is there to eventually happen. Now, in airlines, we're not expecting autonomously driving airplanes anytime soon. But the Internet of Things certainly will benefit 
uh, from the, the technology here. So as you're currently relaxing on the plane, and reading a book or, or watching The Lion King, the airplane is sending signals down to the arrival terminal saying, this part needs a tune-up when I arrive, or I, it needs a replacement. Because 41% of uh, flight delays right now are from mechanical issues. So it'd be significant time savings there. So the next is artificial intelligence. So what is art artificial intelligence? It's the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. When you think of your computers today and your laptops, they're not intelligent. They're doing exactly what we program them to do. Artificial intelligence, and the, the word intelligent means the ability to continuously learn and then make better decisions. By a raise of hands, who remembers IBM's Watson as a contestant on Jeopardy? Yeah, I gave this presentation to my wife and she said, I don't remember that. <laughs> so about half the audience remembered, okay. Um, well, anyway, this was IBM's showcase of artificial intelligence. Watson was a cont contestant, uh, answered the questions by analyzing data rapidly. Uh, so this was their showcase of that. So that's a very embryonic example of that. Now, where we'll see artificial intelligence really grow is going to be in healthcare. On the personalized healthcare side, the Internet of Things, the connected devices that we have, and all the data that's out there is enabling artificial intelligence to impact our way of life. One example is if you have a smartwatch or Fitbit, you can imagine if you were sleeping and your Fitbit could detect that your blood pressure was rising, that your heart rate was irregular, and it actually knew that you were having a heart attack. It knew all of your medical records and therefore woke you up from having the heart attack, sent a note to your doctor, called the ambulance, and by analyzing your records, it knew that taking two aspirin would be the best remedy that you should have right now. That's not too far away. Okay, so 5G, Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence. How is Bartlett investing in all three of these opportunities? In 5G, both American Tower and Verizon are going to be building out the 5G network. American Tower sells, they actually rent the space on their cell phone towers to AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile. So as we need more antennas, because we can't just use the 3G and 4G antennas, this is new technology, you're renting more space and American Tower benefits from that. For Internet of Things, we talked about retail, and there's lots of inventory opportunities there, uh, but a company like John Deere, who sells precision agricultural equipment, which has autonomously driving tractors and sprayers. They also sell sensors that farmers can put out in their field. And this may be 5,000 acres away from where the farmer is, but it can detect disease that's growing on plants and notify the farmers so they can take whatever action they need to. In artificial intelligence, we're looking to companies like LabCorp. They have a division called Covance that helps biotech companies with their research um, as they're going through trials with the FDA. So they can analyze vast amounts of data from uh, lots of different patients and come up with remedies quicker and eventually, I have to say eventually, lower costs. So as I was talking with one of my clients uh, before this presentation, if we think of the market in general, what are the opportunities for next year? And there's a number of Wall Street uh, forecasts out there that it's going to be another big year. Well, one of the ways that they're describing how we could have another positive uh, year in the equity markets, it's driven mainly by Tina. Okay. Not Tina Turner. She hasn't toured in over 10 years and isn't going to keep this bull market going. But you'll now remember the acronym T-I-N-A, which stands for there is no alternative to owning stocks. And the theory is that relative to low yielding cash and bonds, stocks with a 2% dividend yield and over 5% earnings yield look relatively quite attractive. So when we look over the last 10 years in this chart is the earnings yield, which is the amount a company makes divided by their share price. 
over the last 10 years, stocks have, have been attractive relative to bonds. And we've just been in this low interest rate environment for a long time. Now, we're not believers that you should only you know, be all in stocks because they're relatively more attractive. You know, everybody in the room knows that stocks are inherently more risky than bonds. So we value the use of, of cash and bonds in our client portfolios, but more on that in a minute. Also, during the last 10 years, we've seen a significant rise in the shares of growth stocks relative to value stocks. Growth stocks in the last 10 years are up 300%, and value stocks are up only 200%. So now, when we look at valuations, for $1 of earnings of a growth stock, you have to pay 24 times, versus for a value stock, you only have to pay 15 times for that same dollar of earnings. Growth stocks are typically found in um, technology, communications, retail, biotech companies, and you know, Apple, Microsoft, Google are some of the ones that, that we really like uh, today at Bartlett. And on the value side, it's typically banks, oil refiners, healthcare companies, and we're finding opportunities in companies like Comcast, United Health Group, JP Morgan, General Dynamics, to name a few that are all trading right around 15 times earnings with a 2% dividend yield. So now, on to bonds. The base case for bonds this year is that we don't have a recession. As Kyle alluded to, if an inflation stays relatively low and GDP stays positive, then in the bond market, we can collect our 2 to 3% interest and be on our way. However, the bull case to own bonds in your portfolio this year is for protection against times of economic downturns and equity market recessions. So the last two market recessions that we had were pretty severe. The tech bubble burst and the financial crisis. So during both of those times, the equity markets were down significantly and the bond markets retained and grew in value. We're very blessed with a team of tenured portfolio managers at Bartlett, averaging over 20 years of the firm, and we're currently recommending uh, continuing to buy high, quality, high credit quality bonds as opposed to the lower junk bonds at this time. We're also looking at maturities of less than 10 years right now as our sweet, sweet spot for opportunities. So to, to summarize, uh, as Kyle mentioned, there are certainly more risks in both the equity and, and fixed income markets this year after such a great 2019, uh, but we're navigating that by thinking longer term and investing in high quality uh, stocks with a little bent towards adding value companies, and then in bonds, uh, focusing on high credit quality. Well, Brian, as you talked about the Internet of Things and you use these examples, John Deere and so forth, around autonomous tractors or whatnot, it just occurred to me, I, thinking about you and Kyle, you know, still in your 30s, I hope we don't see autonomously managed portfolios. Oh, right, yeah. You know, people, yeah. people still need you. Um, It'll be a long time. Yeah. Um, what was my question? Oh. Um, <laughs> So you talked about the gap that has opened up between the great growth stocks like Microsoft and value stocks like J.P. Morgan or General Dynamics. And another persistent gap of recent times that widened even further last year is that the U.S. stock market has done so much better than foreign stock markets, mm -hmm. Europe, et cetera. So what are the conditions necessary to get foreign markets performing better relative to the U.S., mm -hmm. and where do you see the opportunities? Yeah, the international has been tough. Um, you know, I, Jim, I think you know, the way we look at it is the valuations are certainly compelling internationally. Um, just looking at the EFA market is trading around 14 times earnings uh, versus our market around 18 times plus. Um, so I, from a valuation standpoint, they look attractive, um, but they've been looking attractive for the last 10 years. So I would say um, a lot of the leading economic indicators that Kyle mentioned in the US, um, we're also monitoring those internationally. Um, 
So I, I would use maybe Germany for an example to say, you know, their GDP growth is about a half a percent last year. Uh, so with the manufacturing sector weakening and all the trade tariffs impacting them, we'd like to see a more material increase in some of the conditions and, and, and improvements before we're really adding more to our equity allocations. So I think having a little bit makes sense, uh, but we're not going to be adding to it until we really see more material improvement there. Well, on to Lori, 100% client retention pool um, to wrap this up. Well, Kyle and Brian walked us through a lot of the opportunities and risks that we need to be aware of this year and going forward. So let's take a quick minute to digest what we've heard. Kyle talked about a lot of these risks that we need to be aware of in the context of portfolios, and of long-term financial plans. So if we just heard Kyle talk in isolation, you might be thinking, well, why would I stay invested at all? Or how is it even possible to like stocks and bonds today? So thank goodness we had Brian here to balance those risks, highlighting a lot of really exciting opportunities for the future of our economy. 2020 is gonna be a year where we need to balance risk and opportunity. Together, we can remain steady and focus on our long-term plan and variables that are in our control. So how do we plan for that? Well, let's meet the Garcia family. Linda and Carlos are hypothetical Bartlett clients, and they both enjoyed long careers. Now they're looking forward to retirement, and they have the same question as a lot of us. Can I retire and meet all of my goals? So they wanted to engage Bartlett in financial planning to answer just that question. A lot of their retirement goals are similar to what yours might be, more travel in retirement, spend time with your kids and grandkids, and engage in community service. So as they worked with us on financial planning, we require a fair amount of information from our clients, but it would take too long to go through all of that today. So on the screen and in your packets, we've highlighted some of the key factors to consider. Now, a lot of these factors are not in our control. So we need to focus on the variables that are in our control for the future. Today, we're gonna focus on just three of those. Safeguards, asset allocation, and tax strategies. Now, asset allocation is a vital part of your portfolio and long-term plan so that you can stay steady in the face of risk and ready to take advantage of opportunities as they are presented. As we worked with Linda and Carlos, we started with an investment policy statement. This is a statement that identifies key items for your portfolio and your plan, like time horizon, withdrawal requirements, and of course those long-term asset allocation targets. Without your policy statement in place, it can sometimes be hard to remain disciplined and stay invested through all market conditions. So let's walk through an example of Linda and Carlos's exact portfolio. At the beginning of 2019, they started with a portfolio of half in bonds and half in stocks. So with no action, if they did nothing, their portfolio through the year would have appreciated to 54% in stocks and 46% in bonds. Now we already heard that the risks in the economy and in the stock market are growing, but now you can see that the risk in Linda and Carlos's portfolio has also grown. So we think that this is a prudent time to rebalance your portfolio back to your long-term target or maybe even slightly below. Rebalancing now will set us up to take advantage of, of those opportunities as they are presented, because rebalancing works both ways. Now, as we are advocates of using rebalancing to take advantage of opportunities, we are not advocates of, of trying to time the stock market. Timing the stock market is a strategy that we are certain we will get wrong. Jim had mentioned earlier that at the end of 2018, it was a pretty tough time in the stock market, with the stock market being so depressed. I think he mentioned the worst December in quite a while. 
So if you ran for cover at that time, and you missed just the 20 best trading days of 2019, you would have actually ended the year with a negative return. If you started with a $100,000 portfolio, you could have missed out on $35,000 of appreciation. That's something we don't want for our clients. So as I mentioned before, financial planning deals with a lot of things that are in our control and not our, in our control. And as you see on the screen, some of these assumptions that are not in our control are things like inflation, life expectancy, and market returns over time. But what is in our control is spending. Spending drives a lot of the decisions in the planning process, so it is so important that we focus on that variable at the outset. That's exactly what we did with Linda and Carlos. As we worked through their financial plan, it became apparent that spending was gonna have the biggest impact on if they were successful to meet their retirement goals. When we work through this analysis, we use a stress test that contemplates a lot of different market returns over time. We have to contemplate the good markets and the bad markets. They're both coming. Linda and Carlos posed a question to us. Can we spend more? Maybe we wanna take an extra trip in retirement. So we looked at could they spend an extra $15,000 per year in retirement? And what you can see on the screen is that took them from green light to yellow light territory. Now we're not looking for Linda and Carlos to have a 100% success rate in this stress test analysis. We're looking for 82% or greater. So when they dropped below 82%, our internal sirens went off, and we had to work with Linda and Carlos to be sure they could stick to that original budget. Now our financial planning meetings usually end with action items or next steps, things that need to be completed by you or by us. Now for Linda and Carlos, these next steps included things like rebalancing their portfolio, revisiting their budget, of course, and updating their wills. Without these action items to hold each other accountable, we would likely meet again in a year and be in exactly the same place, but that's not what we want. We don't wanna use financial planning as a tool to raise awareness. We wanna use it to help you meet your goals. So once you have a solid and successful plan in place, we can have a little fun. Opportunities can be presented in a lot of different ways. But most recently, we've been taking action on legislation changes. So in 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, and this changed our tax code pretty dramatically. A lot of our clients came to us and realized that they would no longer have enough to itemize deductions on their tax return. They would just be taking the standard deduction. Well, this presented an opportunity for us. For clients that are charitably inclined, we had an opportunity to use a donor advised fund and thus bunching these charitable deductions for clients so that they could have a greater deduction in one year and give out these funds over many future years. Now this strategy may not be for everyone, but if it does work out, it can have a, a very successful impact on your long-term plan. So late in 2019 and early in 2020, we've been doing just that. With the great stock market performance of 2019, that presented an even greater opportunity to use that highly appreciated stock at really high stock prices and move those funds and those stocks into the donor advised fund for clients. So at Bartlett, we have a team of eight financial planners who are all passionate about helping our clients to create those successful long-term plans and further find meaning in your future goals. We know there's gonna be a, there will be a lot of things to navigate through over the long-term in your plan, things we can control and many things that we can't control. But by having a plan and doing our best to stick to it, we can be ready for what's coming. Thanks, Lori. Um, you talked about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and staying current. Um, at year end, right around Christmas time, the president signed the SECURE Act. And so you might spend a few minutes talking about the key aspects of the SECURE Act and how Bartlett's financial planning team is adapting to it. Sure. 
Um, yes, like Jim said, um, there was even more legislation passed last year called the SECURE Act. Um, it changed a lot of things, but the two most topical things that we've been digging into are the change in required distribution age from retirement assets and uh, IRA inheritance. So first, uh, many of you uh, would remember that forever, it, uh, the magic age was 70 and a half. And so when you turned 70 and a half, if you hadn't already, there was a specific amount that you had to take out of your retirement assets. Well, this has now been pushed back to 72. What's been more impactful and raised more questions from our clients is when maybe their kids inherit their IRA and are they planning in the appropriate way. Uh, so previous to this legislation change, if you inherited an IRA from your parents or if your kids inherited your IRA, uh, they could take that out over their lifetime. Now that's been compressed and um, a child that inherits an IRA from their parents has to take it out in just 10 years. Uh, so this has caused us to really revisit plans with clients and make sure that things are appropriate. So Lori and her comrades love any time there are changes in the tax law. It may be vexing to the rest of us, but they, they really enjoy it. It keeps their life interesting. Definitely. <laughs> um, at this point, that concludes our formal presentation. If you jotted down questions during the course of the session, uh, we'd ask you to raise your hands now. Just hold up your questions. Uh, a couple of our associates will be circulating and collecting those. I see a few hands going up. Um, we, we certainly appreciate you coming, and we, we hope you do leave with the, the sense that Bartlett is indeed steady and ready for whatever may come in 2020. Um, when we met you a year ago in the aftermath of 2018, we certainly weren't downcast. And here we are in the aftermath of glowing returns for 2019, and we don't feel unduly exalted. We're just you know, keeping an even temperament and uh, very focused on analyzing, I think as Brian showed you and Kyle, analyzing uh, companies and industries and securities as carefully as we can, keeping our eyes open to risk, and uh, just looking to balance those two things so that we can achieve your objectives long term. Um, we've got some questions. I'll, I'll kick off with one uh, before those are submitted, and that is a question a client raised with me recently. Um, this extraordinary interest rate situation throughout the world and the negative interest rates in Western Europe uh, and the pressure that has sometimes been put on the Fed to keep interest rates lower, lower, the client wondered, are we headed in that direction? Could we see negative interest rates here in the United States? And uh, that seems like a logical question for our gloomy Gus, otherwise uh, known as Kyle Pullman. Uh, what are the prospects for negative inter interest rates in the US if we look out a couple of years and contemplate maybe a recession? Yeah, I think that's a, you're right, Jim, that's a very fair question. Um, our, our perception is it's a little bit less likely than we would have thought uh, a little over a year ago. Um, if you remember the chart that I had up earlier, I mentioned that there, in the middle of last year, we had $17 trillion of negative yielding debt around the world, and today that's something more like 10 or 11 trillion. Um, so the, the trend is definitely going in the, the correct direction, in our opinion. Um, I would also say that I mentioned some central banks thought if low rates mm -hmm. were good, negative interest rates must be better. But we have seen a couple of countries decide that, hey, we're killing our own banking system and we're not getting the bang for the buck. We're not getting the economic growth that we expected to see from this. We're going to go back and have positive interest rates. So um, our expectation is that the Fed has no interest in, in the United States, the Federal Reserve has no interest in have, having negative rates. Um, but we are a global world, and if everyone goes way, way negative, um, the United States could get pulled down in that. So uh, we would say very low probability, but um, it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Another question I had recently, Kyle, and maybe you're the logical one for this, although Brian and Lori could jump in, um, thinking about the political year and, and not to get into the Republican-Democrat question, but the client was really vexed that there doesn't seem to be any concern about the deficit and the debt level. Uh, low interest rates are making that possible. Um, and her question was, 
is, is this threatening at some point? How, how, is the, how is the deficit, which is arguably now at levels that we usually have during recessions, not, not during good economic times, how's that, how threatening is that? Uh, yeah, it is a threat down the road. It's probably not an immediate threat. So one thing that maybe is a little disingenuous of the chart that I had of you know, debt growing, debt is definitely growing, and that's a big deal, and it matters. But the cost of servicing that debt or the interest that we pay on that debt is much, much lower. So the burden of carrying more debt, both at a corporate level or at the U.S. government level, is less than maybe just the debt picture would tell you. Um, but that does become an issue down the road if we do see interest rates move up meaningfully. Um, at some point, you have to pay for debt. You know, debt is you know, spending today at the expense of spending tomorrow. And um, if the cost of carrying that debt goes up significantly sometime over the next 10 years, that can be a challenge for uh, the administration. So it does matter. The budget deficit does matter uh, in the long run. But I will say that it's created, you know, these low interest rates have created an incentive for politicians to uh, maybe take advantage of that and, and really move that. And that goes across political party. Um, and even CFOs of corporations are saying, hey, why wouldn't I borrow at these extremely low rates and spend, whether that's just to buy back stock or have acquisitions. So it, it's a longer term risk. A couple of questions. Um, in an increasingly consumer driven economy, how much more can they be expected to prop up growth um, with, with pressures from higher costs, perhaps tariff related? But uh, maybe at, at what point is the, is the consumer tapped out? Is that part of our economy peaking or climaxing? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Who would you like to take that? Yeah. Whoever I wants can, it. I can start for a second. Okay. Maybe you guys can Kyle likes on. questions. Uh, <laughs> a little over two thirds of our economy is consumer driven. and so. Um, they've been a big part of what's made the economy recover so well over the last 10 years. But, you know, I've been gloomy all day, but this is actually a positive. Uh, where we are seeing fundamentals get better is actually with the consumer. Uh, we do have lower debt balances with the consumer, better income. You saw the unemployment rate is as low as I can ever remember in my lifetime. Um, so the consumer is actually very, very healthy. And so we don't think the consumer is tapped out in that regard. Jim, I'd just add on that. I think the, you know, I, it was last year, the year before, we talked about the growing student loan debt. That's, that's there. And so credit card balances aren't where we were before the financial crisis, but student loan, student loan debt is certainly a big headwind for, you know, certainly the millennial consumer. Well, a couple of questions. We, we can't dodge these. They are, they are political questions. Um, um, what if the far left is elected? Uh, would that hurt stocks? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that one? Kyle's going to give that one to me, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, our, our philosophy is that you know, we're really agnostic to whatever the political changes may be in our economy, and that the companies that we're investing in are going to adjust to the rules of the game. Uh, so. You know, whether it's higher taxes, higher regulation, lower taxes, lower regulation, you know, um, the companies are going to figure out how to make money. And it's, it's not going to, you know, ruin the economy or the companies that we invest in either way on either, you know, the far left. And you know, I think there are certain areas that, from a headline risk standpoint, whether it's, you know, managed care companies or, uh, you know, banks with more regulation, things like that, I think, you know, could be hurt in the short term, but over the long term, it's it, probably immaterial. And it might be worth mentioning too that you know we're not, you know, whether you feel really positive or really negative about the political environment, there is a lot. There are a lot of checks and balances built into our system. Um, there are a lot of presidents historically who've had ideas that weren't able to get them through because of some of those checks and balances, and vice versa. So we don't you know, operate on the extremes around the political environment, the way you might see in some of those headlines. I mentioned, you know, really, really bold predictions around potential outcomes, and I think that's exactly what I was referencing. Right. Yeah, I think in my lifetime, um, when Ronald Reagan was elected, there was a conviction, and some, part, some people felt 
uh, that we were in for this conservative revolution, I think you'd have to look back on that era and say the changes were very incremental. Uh, Social Security, Medicare, maybe incremental changes. And similarly, I remember early in my career, after sort of a conservative ascendancy for about 12 years, Clinton was elected, and uh, uh, you know, again, the changes wound up being very incremental. So um, we're, we're not we're not getting overly alarmed about that. Whatever takes place in November, I think 2021 and beyond, the American system moves pretty slowly, thanks to our founding fathers. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope that helps the uh, person obviously obviously concerned about that. Um, Kyle, here's one you'd like. Uh, Kyle's a scholar. We have CFAs at the firm. That stands for Chartered Financial Analyst. Eight CFPs. That's Lori's realm, the Certified Financial Planner. And uh, Kyle, um, Lori's also an RLP, a Registered Life Planner, which means she can solve all kinds of other problems. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, uh, but uh, um, where was I going? Um, Kyle's a CAIA, a Chartered Alternatives Investment Analyst, so this is right up his alley. Is there a place for futures and options in a thoughtful portfolio? Yeah, I think so. It depends on how you're using them. So for those of you who don't know, futures and options are derivatives. And all that means in its most simplest form is a derivative. It gets its value, is derived on something else the movement of something else, the price of something else. Um, so just owning options or futures in your portfolio on a solo basis is probably a bad idea. They employ a lot of leverage that creates a lot more volatility in a time where we're trying not to have a lot more volatility. Um, but there are managed futures strategies that have a very different risk. We have an expectation that over the long run, uh, those can provide a different kind of return and help diversify your portfolio. Um, we also know of some option strategies and invest in options strategies to uh, collect the premiums on those options and effectively become a seller of insurance. Um, so, yes, we think so, um, but it's not just specifically owning individual options or individual futures contracts. Question seems right for you, Lori. The questioner wonders um, how does Bartlett take into account talked about taxes, how does Bartlett take into account tax considerations when purchasing or selling securities? Yeah, that's a good question. I kind of thought I was going to get off easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when we, when we go through a financial plan, taxes are definitely a part of that because it's something that we can't ignore and can have a really significant impact in your long-term plan. So when looking at portfolios, it matters if you are gonna sell something for a capital gain or not, uh, and why. Uh, so for example, I had talked about using a donor advised fund. And so all else being equal, if you wanna give money to a charity, using stock to do that is a much more efficient way than selling the stock, giving you the cash, and then you giving the cash to a charity, thus giving you a tax burden and potentially making your gift to that charity less. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for, for those more efficient ways to um, help you and make your plan successful for the future. Yeah. Did that well, we thank you all for coming, and we hope you enjoyed the uh, discussion. If, if we didn't get to any questions, feel free to email those to us. You have uh, email addresses in the book that circulated. You can reach out to your Bartlett advisor. We'd be glad to deal with those questions offline. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the panel. Uh, Lori's available for autographs or pictures, you know, if, you, if, you, if, if, if you'd like. But uh, we're very, very grateful that you came, and we'll be doing the same thing uh, here this time next year. So thank you for coming. Thanks.